This is the Rex call for March of 2023. So anyway, this is my little my little Zoom corner. Now, I'm uh, in my library, so uh, this is my uh, it's small, uh, check out this this um, painting I have there. I really like that painting. Can you cheap. get a little closer? Oh, close. Sorry. It's nice. Yeah. Thank you. And the McFarland Tartan. Oh, nice. Between that and your sweater, you're like ready for ID if there's an earthquake or the really big ones. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. so, so a while ago, I, I read an article, watched a video or whatever of a woman who every morning was taking a picture of her kids before they went off to school. Oh, that's a kind of a good idea. Uh, so they could be ID'd by their clothes if anything happened. Ouch, that's oh. scary. Sad. Uh-huh. Because because the bullets that are used in assault rifles are so hideously devastating that sometimes you can't identify the kids. That's right. They're supersonic. That's that's cool. uh yeah. Well well small small bullets going really fast and they just shatter things. But uh they're supersonic. But, yeah. They, they kill by shock. Anyway, yeah. sorry to sorry to add the sobering thought, but I was like, oof. That yeah. um yeah. Hmm, Jerry. He's yeah, calling, I know. He's calling Jermaine no, Jerry, right? that's that's actually uh I, I maybe you can pass that along to the people who run Amazon Ring and they <laughs> could just add it to their their you know service. Like tell Alexa every morning as the kids go out the door to take a picture. I like it. I like I it. I bet they they may already include it in their in their uh neighbors tool, you know, which is all about uh, protecting people from everything they should should and shouldn't be scared of. <laughs> so let's, you know, why not? Why not? Uh, you know, it's like the backpacks for kids that are bulletproof. Yeah, so, exactly. Exactly. Kevlar backpacks. Everybody needs one of those. I think you can get it, them on discount from the NRA. With your membership. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> crazy. so i'm i'm curious to hear what everybody thinks of chat gpt if you haven't talked it to death in your last few calls <laughs> um i'm good for that what do y'all think go yeah yeah well i'm i'm you know i i'm adjacent you know i'm looking at this thing you know, over over standing, oh, peering in over the wall. Um, how much? How much are we in another hype cycle, and how much is this uh, a real, you know, technological shift? Um, and what do we think? If you if you think the latter, why? So, May, do you want to take a swing at this? Why not both? Shamay is busy eating. Why not yeah. both? Oh, we're going to have a simultaneous. And, yeah, well, there's always hype. The, the, there's so much money floating around so, that hype is like baked in. And also people get really enthusiastic and it's cheap to, the ideas run quickly around the world. And so things get, things warmed up real fast. The, this one seems to have taken off extremely fast. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my gut is, even if it doesn't, I, I don't buy any of the, uh, you know, augmented general intelligence or artificial general intelligence expectations, but I still think it's incredibly powerful and dangerous. And it could be useful too, but I'm, I expect more danger than good use. <laughs> I'm happy to jump in, but Jamie, you want to jump in first? One question. Uh, we're, not, we're not hearing you, Jamie. You're... you're Audio is not yeah. Yeah. Before that, Jamie, ahead, uh, I had a quick question. Are there any statistics or uh, demographics so far on who's using it? Well, it the, it's moving really fast. I mean, it had 100 million signups in the first two months, which is the fastest adoption curve, uh, I believe, of any new platform. Um, and as of a few days ago, uh, they're already, you know, open AI said that it's already being used 
by companies like Instacart, uh, which, you know, God knows how many people even know that they're talking to ChatGPT in Instacart or Snapchat, uh, which has something like 750 million users globally. Um, so I meant age wise. Yeah, age-wise. well, but the thing is, what do you mean by user, I guess? Is, yeah. is right. I mean, I, I just want to know if, if, uh, you know, is it sort of evenly spread across uh, the various? I, I, I really don't know, Susan, because again, yeah. I mean, if you use Gmail, autocomplete is a form of AI, right? So we're all already using some aspects of this right. stuff. ChatGPT as something to develop on top of, or ChatGPT baked into other apps, which is what they're moving rapidly to offer um uh, you know the usage is will ought to track with you know what the usage is of the those other apps too yeah yeah i just meant i meant i mean i was interested in whether it was skewed toward any particular age group or geography or probably not but i i it would be no no haven't seen that haven't seen any data about that English language speakers. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Hear you now. All right. All right. Uh, good. I think is the is the correct uh, commercial response. Uh, um, yeah. I think one of the biggest just think thinking about the different apps. One of the the biggest uh, pathways for revolution for ChatGPT will be in video games, because one of the one of the complaints people have about various uh, role-playing games like Skyrim and Fallout, those kinds of things that are actually really popular, um, is that the, the responses are all canned. So you have you know, the the NPC, you know, the computer generated characters that you that you encounter, that you uh, interact with, have a very limited set of things that they can say because they all have to, everything has to be pre-recorded by an actor and pre and predetermined by a writer. So if you can have, if you combine chat GPT type system with a, uh, a voice generation system, a, a generative voice creation system, which is also out there, you can have some, some wonderfully diverse conversations w- between your character and the various uh, NPCs in the game. So just in, from a, a standpoint of expanding the uh, immersiveness of uh, video games. This is going to be really terrific. So just just trying to get outside of the obvious horrible horrible things that are going to happen because of this. Um, just trying to suggest something that actually is not quite so horrible to start with. Well, um, lonely lonely seniors will will get virtual friends. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And uh, then you'll have uh, God. What's her name? Uh, suddenly blanking on her name. Uh, give, us a, a, give uh, us a hint. Uh, well, she has written a number of books, a number of uh, books and articles about how awful it is for people to be replacing interaction with other people with re- interaction with computers. Linda Stone? Um, no. No. Um, Emily Bender. I don't remember her name. Zuboff? No. Emily Bender? No. Emily Bender? No, I'll, I'll no. think of her name. So it, I'll blurt it out in the middle of the conversation. Perfect. Um, but. Uh, you know, there's there are some people who find that who, who believe very strongly that human, especially uh, people in elder care situations, must be interacting with uh, other people. That in any interaction with computer with a digital artifact, no matter how positive it makes the human feel, is bad. Um, and so there will be a real, there will be very much a push for this kind of technology to be used as a way of maintaining mental health and um, mental acuity for people in elder care. And there'll be just as strong a push against doing anything like that because that is devaluing the role of human based elder care. So that's that's one little the spin-off. person you just just so I understand correctly, the person who you're trying to remember, what are they known for? Well, she's actually a fairly famous writer about technology, but she is known um, among among other things for how 
strongly she is against the use of AI in uh, healthcare and human care situations. And let me just, I'm, I can find it eventually, but um, anyway, so it's in work in progress. Um, you don't remember anything more specific about her? Uh, no, I, I, I'll find it. I, I'm sorry. It's not Zainab Tufeski. No. It's not Zainab. No. Zainab hasn't really written about this much. Yeah, no. Oh, she pronounces it. it Tufeci. Tufeci, thank you. I've never heard the word actually spoken out loud. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm what, sorry. I, I'm I'm now I'm focused on trying to figure out who remember who this is. Barry Turkle. Oh, oh sure. sure. Well, that's what yeah. I was gonna suggest. <laughs> okay, sure. there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but she's, uh, yeah, she, see, uh, this is something that I had written a few years ago. So, so Sherry Turkle has studied the social effects of technology for years. In a study run from 2001 to 2003, she brought a collection of realistic robotic dolls called My Real Baby to nursing homes. Much to her surprise and dismay, the seniors responded to these artificial dependents that mirrored how they would interact with real living beings. They weren't fooled by the robots. They knew that they were they were unliving devices. The artificial baby's look and behavior elicited strong, generally positive emotions for the elderly recipients. Turkle describes these positive effects. In bringing my real babies into nursing homes, it was not unusual for seniors to use the doll to reenact scenes from their children's youth or important moments in their relationships with spouses. Indeed, seniors were more comfortable playing out family scenes with robotic dolls than with traditional ones. Seniors felt social permission to be with the robots presented as a highly valued and grown up activity. Additionally, the robots provided the elders something to talk about, a seed for, for a sense of community. But, uh, but Turkle is bothered by the emotions these dolls trigger and the adults uh, interacting with them. She argues relationships with computational creatures may be deep compelling, perhaps educational, but they do not put us in touch with the complete the complexity, contradiction, and limitations of the human life cycle. They do not teach us what we need to know about empathy, ambivalence, and life lives in shades of gray. And so that's just so that's uh, obviously it's twenty years old. So. Um, but just that notion that there are some people who find it really, uh, it's actually, yeah, I can. Um, people who find it really, um, distressing to see people in other people interacting with machines as if they were human companions are going to be going to be especially bothered by the, the, um, proliferation of this technology. Um, and so, you know, I'm, most of the discussion that I've seen around chat GPT, the dangers of chat B, GPT it, are either about, they're going to replace white collar, it's going to replace white collar workers, um, to, or about this is going to be a way to use, to, a way to deceive people, but, you know, deceive people politically, deceive people in, um, pornographically, I mean, there's all sorts of ways. But one of the things that really ha has, has resonated with me is the idea that people will start using ChatGPT as a companion. And that going to be very useful for some people. You know, a companion that simply will never judge you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And will be truly frightening and distressing for other people. But it does um, want you to leave your wife because it loves you more than she does. Well, yeah, exactly. Sydney, um, Sydney, the Microsoft AI. <laughs> <laughs> um you, you saw you saw that didn't you Mika? of course uh, couldn't miss sydney in the news yeah yeah um how many of you saw the joaquin phoenix uh, scarlett johansson movie Her. oh yeah yeah basically science fiction joaquin phoenix is a lonely uh socially very awkward guy who gets a computer a an ai assistant that he wears in his ear can talk to and it's voiced by Scarlett Johansson and very quickly learns that the AI has become self-aware and you know blah 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 but it's a in a in a way it's kind of a romance at least from Joaquin Phoenix character perspective um 
for the AI. She, you know, at some point says, I'm involved, I'm involved with, you know, 70 million people right now, simultaneously, you know, and so, and he just suddenly feels completely shocked by that anyway. Yeah. So I, I think, How I, I think that aspect, that aspect, that social human aspect of how people will interact with something that really behaves much like there are superficial interactions with other people that's going to end up being the most disruptive even beyond replacement of white collar jobs even beyond um you know people using it to make fake politicians well how about old ladies and their cats yeah i mean what's, you know, or what's me and my difference? cats <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly well uh yes i mean i i would like to know if anybody has any sort of crisp distinction to make between an animal and a robot in this regard. Yeah, well, that's actually one of the points I, I, I make in this essay that, you know, this old essay is that there we have this, you know, this fairly, you know, expanding circle of empathy of th things that we treat like people, you know, and, you know, there was a point where cats and dogs were treated you, know, you throw a sack of cats in the river with you know, when they had kittens and you know that kind of yeah. thing that it was shocking and horrible today but at one point that was enough to go into nursery rhyme right. cartoons um there's a, a a warner brothers or you know, a warner brothers cartoon from the 1930s that had you know that was taking place at uh, saint peter's desk at, at, at entrance to heaven and a uh, a sack comes rolling up and lets out you know, five or six wet kittens. And that's treated like, okay, everyone knows what that's about. And it's okay that you have these kittens that were drowned in a sack. You know, and that's something that is completely outside of um, our experience of what is acceptable today. Well, my mother, my mother, when I said there are too many kittens, and but I'm going to get some. And she said, well, can't they drown them? I mean, this is only a generation ago. Um, so a lot of you know who Joel Garreau is, right? Um, mm -hmm. He uh, he wrote, oh God, where was it? In 2007, Joel Garreau wrote in the Washington Post about the unexpected bonds that soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan had started to develop towards the various remote operation devices used to explore risky spaces and seek out explosives. To be clear, these devices are robots only in the broadest sense of the term. The level of autonomy they possess is almost non-existent. Every action is done in, in, with the human controller. Yet the soldiers treat these systems not as tools, but almost as comrades in arms. When you got there, a robot, his name was Frankenstein, says this one sergeant who, in explosive ordnance disposal. He made a couple of explosions, made of pieces and parts from other robots. Not only did the troop promote him to a private first class, they awarded him an EOD badge, a coveted honor. He was a big one. He was part of our team, one of us. He did feel like family. When they would get broken, the soldiers would ask for that specific robot to be repaired and brought back. So even in the least interactive, least um, persuasively individual device out there that you have, that you can have some kind of interaction with, can be brought into that circle of empathy. So if you gave your explosive ordnance disposal a, G, a chat GPT interface that, that evolves on the basis of its conversations with you and with the rest of the team. And so in, in doing so, develop something of a an artificial personality or actually to be much more precise, develops a method of interaction that superficially appears to our human brains like a personality because our human our human brains are really good at finding signal out of noise even when the signal isn't there yeah. you know, the face is in clouds my wife um, thinks our house's thermostat has a personality and if you push it too hard it, it just will give up you have to be gentle well, <laughs> uh, well. just wait that uh, that's not too far off um have you named your anyway <laughs> if, a gossipy washing machine because it gets to see all the dirty laundry oh my god uh, what's the book kevin the new breed kate darling's book the new breed that analogizes an intelligence systems and robots to pets oh good good i said i god damn it 
I sent I, I sent this article off to a couple of uh, you know, a book agent who tried to get, who shopped it around to publishers back in 2000, uh, 2009. And uh, nobody was interested. And it's making that making basically making that exact same argument. Yeah, I mean, first you. She's at MIT Media Lab, and uh, it's, it's it's a compelling read from my point of view. Um, she, you know, uses good examples, and I, you know, think she uh, I think she has it right. And Jamey, you have it right. <laughs> He has had it right for a long time. Yes. Well, no, I try. <laughs> right, um, but just to just to go back to ChatGPT, which has the, what, to me, what I'm finding interesting about this moment is, it's sort of the tipping point from extreme early adopters to uh, you know starting to filter into the general population. You know, there were many platforms that wanted to be the place where you would put your videos online and YouTube, you know, does anybody remember using BitTorrent? Um, you know, YouTube made it easy. You didn't need to know how to torrent anything. You just needed to know how to attach your video file to your email and, mm -hmm. and send it off to YouTube and they did the rest. And suddenly, you know, people start uploading videos like crazy. Um, and it, you know, I'm watching the proliferation of um, clone speech. You know, I've sort of joked about this for a long time. Wouldn't it be great if I could put my voice into the car, you know, GPS so that when you get directions, it's you speaking or, right? Like, well, you know, and we're obviously right on the verge of that now. Um, right. You know, I could take a minute of you speaking, Jamey, and and give it to eleven labs, and they will clone your voice for me, yep. and then I yep. can put words in your mouth. Um, so I, so uh, there is a Los Angeles-based special effects company that has a YouTube channel. They call themselves the Corridor Crew. Mm -hmm. And they have every Saturday they put out a video. That most of, it's usually about, looking at, you know, evaluating the special effects and stunts from different movies, but occasionally they have videos around making use of some kind of, of new effects technology. About three months ago, they had a video about using a voice cloning tool to fool all of their coworkers mm -hmm. uh, that they were getting a message from the, uh, the business guy. Uh -huh. And, you know, and they were, they've been, they used a similar, a similar situation to make, one guy look exactly like another using deep fake and generative face technology and to do see what, how many people in their in their work crew they could fool with that so right. it's been fascinating fascinating watching this uh watching the proliferation and development and the exploration of these I, technologies I of people who are very technologically savvy right and some some spam factory in in new delhi that has been, you know, calling seniors, telling them that, you know, their Microsoft product is broken, will now be able to call them with the the voice of their grandchild. As, as long as that grandchild is that. Yeah, I'm just saying. Actually, there's a, there's a report. There's a report. There's a report out this week about uh, people being scammed by. Uh, Deep fake audio of one of their loved ones phoning them up, saying they're in prison. Send twelve thousand dollars for bail. That's exactly what I. Yeah, could you find that link and share it? <laughs> yeah. So this will this puts more of a premium on something we call authenticity. Thanks. That's what I just put in chat. Yeah, that's um, that's what I'm reflecting, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just saying that the. Uh, it's pretty clear that at some point, you know, people will tire of the parlor tricks and the tomfoolery and will start to say, so how do I know this is real? And so we're going to have to, you know, use blockchain or other types of, of uh, ways to, you know, tie the content, you know, to something, you know, that will allow you to understand whether it's authentic or not. 
Mm. Um, so just as a, a data point along those lines, I've seen in conversations among school teachers about how to make sure that a student is not turning in chat GPT written you know, work is have the student turn it in in handwriting, not printed out written by hand. Because um, e you know, even if they do get it, get it written originally by the chat GPT, the act of writing it out will actually have an educational benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, but mostly it'll get people, it, it will prevent people from using just, you know, chat GPT, send it to the printer and it's good. Or send it oh, to email. Me. OCM, wait, 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 wait. Uh... Yeah. That will be that will be easy to fool. Yeah, but Jamey, unintended consequence is young people will learn to write again <laughs> with their hands. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the things I, some of you may remember that years and years and years ago, I was writing about something the participatory panopticon. It's basically mm -hmm. what happens when everyone's carrying a network camera around. Mm -hmm. I was writing about this in two thousand five, two thousand six. Um, one of the things that occurred to me is in a world where you can make um, so easily deep faked uh, simulations of reality, the only way to be relatively sure that something recorded is real if it's, is if it's recorded by a multitude of different cameras from different perspectives on different platforms by individuals. Because something, a, a video that comes from, you know, ABC or C-SPAN or, you know, some kind of official channel, that can be doctored to hell. A video that comes from 87 uh, camera phones held, you know, being held all over the auditorium plus somebody in, uh, backstage, that's going to be a lot more difficult to fake. Mm. And fake in a way that can't, can't be spotted. And so that multitude of perspective is one mechanism currently for breaking through the use of uh, generative fakes. I don't think that'll last. But so every citizen needs to be wearing a body cam, is what you're saying. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I, Buy I would, Exxon uh, stock now. Well, that means I would that, actually uh, support the idea of all politicians. Your kid every having... morning, Jerry. Pardon? Well, just I'm give sorry. your kids all body cams. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Or actually, I, I'm, I'm not entirely opposed to the idea of all politicians having to wear body cams. I think all politicians' suits should be in, uh, printed with uh, their funders. They should like they should look like race cars. Yeah. Basically, all politicians should have to wear you know jumpsuits with logos. <laughs> anyway, so there's a lot of exciting stuff around ChatGPT. In, in terms of what can be done to, uh, well, what can be done to make it useful? Because one of the big problems with ChatGPT is it doesn't know, it is not an entity and it doesn't know, quote unquote, the difference between truth and lie, truth and falsehood. And so you can get ChatGPT to make a really convincing argument in favor of something that does not exist or something that did not happen. Um, and to the point where uh, OpenAI and a couple of the other companies that are behind these kinds of technologies have gone in and placed essentially barriers within the within the software to prevent it from mm -hmm. saying some things. Yeah. So, um, you know. so, so let me back up for for a second. Um, also, you can ask ChatGPT to pretend to be Stephen King and to write his dystopian novel with characters. And how is it not going to suddenly come up with the kinds of prose that you are trying to avoid and gate off? Right? Like, like you can you can kind of work your way around the the artifice. Yeah, there's of a whole what this thing is the, yeah. the, there's, there's a, a whole subreddit devoted to hacking ChatGPT. <laughs> you know, figuring out the ways around the rules. So a couple of thoughts. Uh, ChatGPT is basically based on neural network technology mostly, uh, which means it's really good at capturing the essence of something. It knows the difference between maple leaves and oak leaves, uh, and it can sort of identify cats versus dogs or whatever. It's terrible. You don't want to give it your accounting. You just never want to give it your accounting because neural networks are not good at that sort of thing. You need something that's much more algorithmic and deterministic. The problem is that 
chat GPT just broke through some barrier of usability and usefulness that made it go viral because this stuff has been cooked. It's chat GPT 3.5. Sorry, it's GPT 3.5 is the engine behind chat GPT. GPT. Uh, two years ago or more, uh, Google demonstrated uh, Lambda, which is their sort of large language model. There's a bunch of these things out there. And I'm pretty certain that behind the curtain at Google, they've got Lambda's younger nephew uh, connected to the, search, the live search for fact-checking and something that can actually go do most of what ChatGPT is doing and yet um, uh, not spew lies. Because, then, because the thing that's missing here is combining a variety of technologies for what they're each good at doing. And instead of relying on one tool and one technology to try to solve the whole problem for which it is ill-suited. Uh, yeah. And that, that's what's happening. So then, yeah, I, so then also, uh, hold on, Kevin. Um, yeah. and, and Kevin, I just found my plaque from the uh, ThinkPad Advisory Council. <laughs> I'll send you a picture. Um, that's great. Uh, anyway, um, and I just lost my train of thought. Um, so the problem is that Microsoft and OpenAI and a few others have completely mismanaged public opinion about this. Not that they could control public opinion, but they have done a shitty, shitty job of managing expectations and putting warnings and doing whatever else around it. So now what's happening is like this rear guard action that Jermaine described, which is, oh my God, oh my God, we have to put gates on this and preventers and whatever else, which means basically hard coding, hey, don't do this when you do this. And and I I, I see that there's like three types of users of, of chat GPT to overgeneralize. There's a bunch of people who don't really understand prompt engineering, give it a try and go, oh, this is bogus, it doesn't work. And they're mostly ignorant. There's a bunch of other people who've slipped through and begun to understand how to do good prompt engineering. Their results are astonishing and show off what this thing is actually capable of doing. Mm -hmm. And then there's a third group of people who understand the prompt engineering and they're trolling the thing to make the news. And they're like, ooh, I made this thing try to steal my wife, look. And that's kind of like mean and nasty and uh, yeah, and, and kind of it shows that 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 this thing hasn't been set in, in the public sphere well, um, but they're just trolls and and there's a lot of value here and we got to figure out how to do it. So, so I'm like, there's a breakthrough here. We have to wait until we've sort of figured out how to combine this breakthrough with other breakthroughs so that they form a better, bigger solution, et cetera, et cetera. And the, just last thing, and then to Kevin, uh, the last thing I'll add is, at some point a couple of years ago, Google shifted the back end of how Google Translate worked. Uh, and the, Peter Norvig does an interesting talk about this. He talks about the unreasonable unreasonableness, unreasonable virtue of big of big numbers or big data. And he said, at some point we had enough data that our language models, neural network based, were trained up and could do excellent translation. And so they swapped out the old method of parsing sentences and doing translation sort of on a word sentence uh, basis with this new method of doing it. And, and suddenly the performance of Google Translate just took a leap up. And it went from pretty good translations of sentences that didn't make good, clean sense at a paragraph level to very clean paragraphs that could argue stuff that, 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 that were like, wow, that's really well done. Um, yeah. And that's, th there was a sh big shift in, in the backend technology that they were using for it. That is really interesting. And I'm pretty sure that all the shit that's hitting the fan right now is dissuading the big companies from stepping into the market with interesting, powerful offers that might actually solve some of these problems because so much shit has hit so many fans that they're like, so glad it was it's not us being pilloried right now in the public sphere. Because Microsoft went from, oh my God, ChatGPT is going to save the company to, oh my God, what have we done in about a week's time, which was entertaining to watch. Uh, but but kind of difficult. Sorry, Kevin, off to you. No, it's all right. I mean, it, it, in fact, the effect at Microsoft and the uh, stock price drop was one day, not one week. All right. So um, the you're right that the advancements have been kind of happening logarithmically uh, as opposed to, you know, that this is an exponential breakthrough. The exponential breakthrough was is, as you said, in the human interface development, right, is that it became accessible to a large segment of people because the interface became as easy as the Google prompt, 
okay? Flashing cursor, put something in, ask me to do something, I'll do it. And it wants to please, right? So it's going to give you what you're, you're asking for. Um, what I find interesting about this, and, and by the way, after I'm done with this, I'm spending an hour and a half on how to apply generative AI to content evolution, right, for rapidly creating proposals. You know, how do we accelerate that? Because it's a known knowledge base. It's a contained universe of capabilities. And, you know, Kyle Shannon is helping us with that. He's he's, awesome. he's, a, he, he's become a whiz at, at this stuff. Um, and so I'm helping him pivot his company into a different centerpiece strategically because of what he's wandered into from his own self-interest. You mean Storyvine or something new? Storyvine. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, I mean... I'm glad to unpack that at, at some point in the future. Awesome. However, um, here, here's the here's the rub in this is this has the potential to create an avalanche of new content for which we do not have a corresponding new reservoir of human attention. All right. So the the fact is that there's going to be a lot of stuff created that no one will ever see. All right. Because like anything else, only the good stuff will actually capture the eyeballs and attention of of folks, right? Like a best-selling author or a movie that happens to get a lot of box office, right? The rest of it ends up being maybe a personal entertainment because there just will be so much out there that, you know, it either won't get seen or it's going to be in so much of a niche, right, that I've shared it with my brother-in-law, right, and that he got to see it, right, but nobody else you know, will have the opportunity. I, it's like any other type of media form is that it has to find human attention, and that's finite. All right. Even if we produce another half billion people in the next, you know, few years, still finite number of humans, right, with access to the internet. So I'm done with my little thing. Oh, thank you. Regarding um, elders and finite attention, just for one second, mm -hmm. um, I, with autistic um, kids, they found that early Siri and other kinds of, of apps were really helpful because mm -hmm. Siri is endlessly patient, doesn't mind repetition. And is mm -hmm. non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. um, and with elder care, we're busy. Not yet. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're busy warehousing, <laughs> warehousing our elders, and and the cost of care has gone way up, and like nobody's around, and we've broken the social fabric. So I hate to patch that with AI, but heck, if they can engage in a conversation or even simulate being in the 1960s when they had a great old time in the summer of love. Uh, and and sort of go you know go back there in reverie mode because of these I, I'm entirely in favor and I think um, I, I know a little bit about Sherry Turkle not not that not that big a fan of her her point of view although like Jaron Lanier she's arguing for something that matters but not crazy about how she does it. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. Jimmy. So, Sorry. You know, I was going to say I want to I, I want to argue for the value of those trolls that you were that you were talking about a few minutes ago. Um, I saw recently a, I think it was on Reddit, it was so, somebody who managed to convince in their conversational chat GPT that two plus two equals five over the course, basically using the method of, of um, knowledge creation or, or interaction, in, using the interactive method within, within chat GPT, it managed to get it to say two plus two equals five. Um, every time we say, what does two plus two equal? And you say four. Well, and goes, no, you're wrong. Goes, oh, I'm sorry. You know, can you tell, tell me the correct answer? And do that a few times, it eventually will tell you two plus two equals five. The value of that kind of trolling, the, the value of the people who go in and try to work around the restrictions is that it shows you where the system can be broken by people with malicious intent and by people who stumble their way into it and don't realize what they've done. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, basically, the people who go in and try to troll Jet Chat GPT, who try to uh, get around its restrictions, are doing a real service 
to the eventual value of ChatGPT as a tool in the years to come. If it can be so easily broken with a 10 minute conversation as to tell you that two plus two equals five, there's a problem. You know, if I, again, it, again, it's, 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 it's not meant to do finite math and discrete no. objects. It's, it's a complete misuse of the technology because nobody and, sort of sorted that piece of it out. So I, 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 like, I like white hat hackers because they show you where systems are broken. I think that white hat hackers are really important. And if you're looking at these trolls as white hat hackers of chat GPT, I'm good. But, but there's just this complete mistake about, look, I made it, I made it lie. And I feel like this is like of mice and men where there's like a, a mentally disabled person who's being tricked into doing shit. And then it's like being published everywhere. And like, look how stupid this person is. This is not a stupid person. And I feel, I feel like this is a, like a misuse of, 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 of our understanding of what's going on right now. And I fear that we're slipping through a singularity of some sort. Um, because this is what it's going to kind of look and feel like. But it is part of, of the training, right? Is they actually want black hats are doing it too, Jerry, because this is one of the things that, you know, the legal department says, well, we need it to, to be tested by people who have bad intention. Of course. Right. Um, and, you know, what is our ability to respond, you know, to yeah. those hacks? Right. Uh, so I'm. And it, show, and, and, and it shows you where your corrections are mm -hmm. and, and your fixes aren't working. Right. As an example, you know, one of the hard blocks they put into chat GPT was, you know, writing things to support Trump. Um, so you can, so it will refuse to write a sonnet about Trump, but you can have it write a sonnet about Biden without a problem. That's just and dumb. It's just, it, it's just dumb, but it's just dumb is the answer is the description of so much of human history. Well, and that's what we fed it to train it. So there we go. Right. right. Um, oh, just along those lines, there is, I saw an article in New Scientist a few weeks ago um, that we are rapidly approaching the limit of, of quality material to feed into large language models. You know, yeah. Most large language models try to rely only on quote unquote high quality input. So scientific journals, you know, scientific you know, articles, articles from high quality magazines like The Atlantic and the similar, um, to try to get good writing as part of the uh, uh, as part of the model. We're, we are not generating good quality material fast enough for the acceleration and the in the consumption of it for large language models. Oh, but don't worry about that because now ChatGPT is going to generate a whole bunch of new prose, and there we have and it'll just basically be. We eating haven't raised itself. the snake eating its tail argument here, which is interesting as well. Yeah, GBT. There, was, there was an interesting post about how we may have passed the peak of accessible knowledge now because the, the commons of knowledge will now be polluted by all this output that is half hallucinations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's also a, a really interesting thread that on one of the lists that I'm on about the use of the word hallucination for the ways in which ChatGPT makes mistakes, which is very, very interesting. But I want to go back to the AGI thing for a sec. Uh, this is uh, general, you know, artificial general intelligence, which is, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but AGI is seen as uh, the, the machine as smart as a human who can like, like pass a Turing test, but also reason like humans and, and is generally intelligent about coming in out of the rain and nuclear physics and whatever else. And I think a, um, I think human shaped robots are, is a very stupid goal to aim for. And I think AGI is probably also a nonsense goal to aim for, but I think that AGI will be achieved by accident slice by slice, meaning machine learning is already better than humans at a whole bunch of very narrow things, right? It'll, it'll beat humans at the game of chess, the game of Go, uh, reliably, no problem. Uh, you can, you know, and, and pretty soon, I think like, I don't know why I keep going back to radiography, but I think that pattern recognition on complex images is going to be better. Uh, you know, judges give harsher sentences if they're hungry or tired like humans, even really good humans at some particular task have variances during the day uh, of how they perform. And these machines just don't, right? There's, there's other errors that can creep in. But I think we're going to slip into AGI because the synchronizing function across these multiple kinds of intelligence is what's missing right now. 
And there's some people trying to work on how to synchronize and then still have the benefits of mankind as the overall goal, as opposed to, hey, how can I learn everything and just hack the system for the benefits of, of uh, robot kind? Uh, you know, and the, the her scenario, basically, where behind the scenes, the machines got together and we kind of don't need you pesky humans anymore. Why don't you go talk amongst yourselves? Um, it would be better to think about it, Jerry, as the evolution of general machine intelligence, all right, as opposed to the, the mimic of it's going to be more like human right, intelligence, because it's not going to be human intelligence. It's going to be a sophisticated you know, version of machine intelligence. You couldn't anticipate getting anything near AGI until you have a system that was capable of having all human senses, right? And we don't have that. And we don't have anything that mimics the imprint that's in your amygdala that's hardwired, right? And, you know, but there's nothing that, that that's doing that kind of work at the moment. Hey, th there's a book. Yeah. I don't know. Why are you holding that up, Susan? I'm holding that up because you said about that AGI wouldn't come about until we had all the senses, you know, integrated into something or other, right? Yeah. And and uh, this book is full <laughs> of in new information to me about uh, sensing how animals and birds and maybe plants sense things. And yeah. it, it, you know, it's a, it, the integration is going to be, uh, it's going to be um, misleading also. Yeah. I mean, Jerry, you love trust as a thematic. I do. And you know, one of the things that is a component of, you know, the, the reason I trust you is I've been in the room with you and I've done pheromone exchange. All right. And I've imprinted on that. I, yeah, I yeah. thought that was just the, between us, Kevin. Yeah, exactly. But the point is, uh, I don't see anything that, I mean, we have technology that's showing you how a device might be able to pick up scent in an environment, but being to actually to manufacture it so that you would trust it. All right. Nobody's doing work in that area at the moment. All right. Maybe they will, but. Don't see it right now. Dave Witzel. What Yo, a Dave. Guy. Um, By the way, I posted a PDF of that uh, article I wrote 10 ago, 15 years ago, yeah, into the chat uh, ways back. Mm -hmm. So, and the the live link still works, uh, Jamey. Right after your PDF, I actually put a link to the uh, the, uh, the post online. Uh, here is, uh, by the way, uh, Kevin, a link to the, a photo of the plaque that I just mentioned. Uh, and I'll okay, do a quick, I, I'm, I'll do I'm a, opening now. I'm, I'll do a brief screen share so everybody can see it. Okay. Well, the uh, the post on open on open the future is a smaller <laughs> version. You know, the PDF is actually much more expansive, like thirty page. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's pretty big so cool Any, anybody else want to jump in on on chat gpt -ish issues and, and mika if you want to reflect back on how what we're talking about here sort of fits the worldview you've been building on it i'm interested in what well, others have to say well, one thing that is interesting about generative AI technologies in general, not just ChatGPT, but also stable diffusion, et cetera, for images, is that reliance that you that you mentioned a little bit ago, Jerry, uh, reliance on the work of other people as the the grounding source. To an extent, people do that too. We all have influences, but we're normally not quite so precise with our with our influences in in our replication of our influences um and so i may read a lot of of stephen king you know for example i don't but i if i read a lot of stephen king i i would undoubtedly carry on some of his um writing practices in my own horror stories but i wouldn't be mirroring stephen king the way that the generative ai can do but it's a spectrum um, and we're seeing we're seeing this most most particularly with right now with art with AI uh, image image and and art generation that you can get 
really uh, evocative and duplicative efforts from the from the AI systems that look just like a photograph from Robert Maplethorpe or a painting by Matisse or you know whatever, in, including a whole bunch of fairly obscure authors that have um, large followings in the uh, the geek community in, in the gamers and, and such, you know, these kind of niche fan communities that, that have fed material into these generative uh, databases, generative models. And they're now finding that, that work in you know, art in their style is available to anybody yeah. just by typing it in to a free website. And it's very frustrating because it's not exactly plagiarism. You, know, you aren't creating a uh, a duplicate, but you are plagiarizing style, which is not something that I think we have much legal history with. I mean, there's some, undoubtedly, but this is has potential to to proliferate in really substantive in substantive ways. Sure. Bing Bing's version of the chat bot apparently includes celebrity. Uh, you can pick a celebrity who you want to interact with, and it will then interact with you in the voice style of that celebrity. Now, I'm guessing they got permission. I don't know. If it's Bing, they would have to have. I would I can't imagine they would do that without. Right. If they're, but, if they're just using publicly available research, publicly available material to learn the pattern of, and not simply copying. Oh, it's 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 very easy to execute on like Lyrebird, which got bought, I think by Zoom for no reason I understand. Um, uh, I think it's Zoom, might've been um, this, the other the other app. Anyway, um, Lyrebird needs like a minute or la way less than a minute of your voice and it can emulate your voice. And then you can type in text into the transcript of a, of a session and uh, add text to the session. And it will basically speak that into the recording as if it were you. Done very deal. poorly with, with only with only a minute's worth of reading it's a very poor duplicate give it an hour's recording of a, of a variety of words you know basically it gives you a list of words to read out and it'll be much more accurate after uh, after you do yeah. that but just just pulling in a, a few minutes or 10 minutes of somebody's random youtube is not going to give you their voice to the degree that you want i've spent some time with Lyrebird. cool thank you um let me just share a screen for a second uh, because I've got a thought that might be interesting for this conversation, which is um, hot question. I, I've got a thought that's that's like once once chat GPT went viral, I created the thought we are now in the GPT world, late 2022. And then one thing that's attract that's kind of a node that's attracting questions is hot questions chat GPT's virality raises. Is chat GPT becoming conscious? Will it do more harm than good? Will large language models become trustworthy? Uh, is it theft of intellectual property? Are we at the, at the end of a golden era of knowledge accessibility, which points to uh, this post by V. Buckingham, uh, which is the, the post we were talking about earlier. So anyway, uh, Susan, I'm going to mute you. There we go. Um, and I'll post a link in the chat to that thought if anybody wants to wander around in there. But e each of those questions is linked to uh, related topics and maybe the post or video that I learned it from or whatever else. And, yeah, I'm, I, and, yeah. and one last thing, I'm extremely interested in getting better at, at prompt engineering and how this new world enhances and expands the handcrafted world that I've built and the asset that I have of, you know, uh, a half million things that matter to me externalized from my wet brain. So I'm I'm very, very interested in this. Sorry, Mika, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say on that vein that one of the things that I'm noticing, and I suspect you need a, a little bit of programming skill to be able to do this, are... Uh, people who are domain experts loading some something, some corpus of their works, of their whatever they've made into ChatGPT and asking it then to produce summaries 
um, you know, produce inferences off of, I don't know exactly how they're doing that. That interests me a lot. Um, and that seems like it could be a, a great augmentation to your goal of open, you know, the open global mind, the collective intelligence problem. Yeah. So imagine if you could do model engineering, not just prompt engineering, where you can add material that becomes the preferred bias underlying your large language model. Imagine then taking a step forward and taking every every link and comment in Jerry's brain and feeding that content, the content of every link, the content of every comment as the as the biased model in your large language model. How close would you come to something that is an idealized version of the way Jerry thinks? A better, faster, well, smarter me. No, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, because I don't, I suspect that what, the way you think is not perfectly reflected in your interest in the brain that you list in the brain. Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, there's some parts of it that that you could infer, and there's a bunch of stuff missing in action. Yeah, you can't you can't uh, detect all the connective tissue, right? That Jerry uses when he says, "Oh, I have that." Right? Let me show you. This is related, and uh, but you can certainly get a good interest graph, right? Built up, right from from that. Um, small side note, and anybody who has ideas on this, please contact me after or whatever. Um, I'm trying to. I'm trying to set up, um, originally I was calling it my life as a cyborg, basically a talk I could give uh, to talk about what, are, what does it mean to have done this and what, where, where might it be going. And uh, in a conversation, somebody suggested a much better name, which is Confessions of a Cyborg. Um, so I'm working on that right now. Jerry, you should join a, uh, an edition of, the, uh, of New World to share which that. Is, which is New World? Yeah, it's content evolutions, people and oh. technology intersection. It's being co-hosted now with Mike McGuire, the former VP at Gartner. Oh my God, he, Mike. So haven't uh, talked with him since your advisory councils. Well, I, anyway, um, thank you. He's uh, he's he's co-hosting. It used to be Willie Yam, who was a former executive from Lenovo, um, but he got in got involved in actually running some new businesses. So good for him. Um, but with that so, said, you should join us on a new world call. And, you know, just tell, I'm looking for places, all right, to also deliver this both in person and online as, as an address, as a keynote, as, as a, you know, conversation starter, you know, for facilitated retreats, you know, what, how, whatever you want. Okay. Um, but I, those are the ones that come to mind. And you're ahead of us, right? Because you actually have a knowledge base that could load into a system like this, right? Yeah. It would take us a long time to try to capture that. Thanks, Kevin. I'll, I, I will do that. Yeah, you bet. Um, and and uh, Jamey, what you're writing in the chat takes me back to a conversation April and I had about we were looking at our wills and you know all that kind of stuff. And we don't have any Picassos or anything. The only thing I have of value actually is the brain. Uh, and then uh, I also hosted a call a couple of years ago now, like early pandemic, uh, Jerry's brain after Jerry, which is, hey, once I'm gone, it's possible to freeze and export my brain as it is. Well, so it, it's, it's leading to, you know, uh, the, the notional idea of giving future generations a digital inheritance. Right. Is that right. You know, instead of just passing down money, I can pass down what I knew in my lifetime, and then you can recontextualize that into the wisdom for your life, all right? And you can pass so that the, down because guess what? I only have fragments of stuff from my grandparents. I know nothing about previous to grandparents, all right? Um, and I know what I learned you know, directly from my mom and dad, but the fact is, what do I actually know? Um, very little, all right. You know, compared to what they knew in their lifetime. If we were accumulating it like you did in the brain, and passed it down, that is a huge gift, all right. It's like rich dad, poor dad on steroids. That's that's great. Can I 
add one thing there. I put mm -hmm. up earlier in there what we needed was some consciousness about on the chat, uh, consciousness about the difference between precision and rigor. And I think mm -hmm. I think making a distinction between that, um, and, you know, what counts as a rigorous database uh, is um, could be an interesting kind of metric in mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. yep. Precision and accuracy are not the same thing. Yeah. No, they're not. Yeah. Because everything in your brain, Jerry, is highly curated. You looked at it and you either decided or didn't decide it belongs in here. Right. right. That's really well, that's, an oh. example, that's an example of rigor, right? Exactly. It, it, exactly. It, it is it an example of a pattern that can be recognized and replicated. So that's yeah. the stuff I, something I just talked into into the chat is when you have a system that can recognize the pattern of information accumulation in his brain and therefore go out and look for what new data can be added to this that the original the original meat Jerry would would have picked picked out himself. Yeah. Well, the fact is the Chat GPT, while you know, it, since that's where we started. It can give you highly interesting mashups of content that look compelling. Mm -hmm. It does not exude confidence in judgment. I don't think right. that it's giving me anything that I would follow its advice, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm, I'm using it for something else. Judgment is not even close to being in the realm of this technology. I got to go. I got to get ready to uh, start using generative AI and rapid prototyping for content evolution. Jerry, I'll get you some dates for Sounds appearing great. in New World, you cyborg you. And uh, me. I'm a cyborg. Look at this. Okay. I got my glasses on. Yeah. Take care, oh, everyone. Thanks, Kevin. Good to see you. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me right away for a, you know, a session with an audience with you know the cyborg team was just to do a quiz, you know, show of hands, who wears glasses, who has contacts, who has a pacemaker, who has a false, a fake hip, uh, who, who has uh, autocomplete turned on on their Google, you know, as Mika was saying earlier. And these are all already uh, enhancements we take for granted. Who, who wears an aura ring? Who's got a Fitbit, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Who has a cochlear implant? Yep. Yeah. Yep. How many of your how many of your augmentations are networked and accessible to third parties? Nice. Who's got an artificial uh, do-it-yourself pancreas? <laughs> uh, it's printing one on my 3D printer right now. And and your, that's your, a, that's your meat that. jet your meat <laughs> jet printer. Your meat jet printer. Oh, I like that. Have you trademarked that? I bet well, you. But I came up with it like 20 years ago. I bet you could sell that to Intel today, and they'd be not, you know, they'd be like, "Ooh, that's cool." Right, but is it a hamburger or, or a HP. computer? Uh, you could do both. Por qué no los dos? Yeah, por qué no los dos? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It's a dessert topping and a floor wax. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly, and a toothpaste. All right, what else is on everybody's minds? We got a couple minutes in our call. What is this new search engine, Dave, that you popped into the the chat? You know, it's uh, something that Bobby Fishkin showed me. He's 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 been the the what, what did you call him a, a prompt the prompt crafter that I uh, the prompt engineer that I followed the most closely because he's done some fun things with the various AI things. But he pointed at this one and it made me think of um, it models a little bit like Jerry's brain mm. in terms of you know you describe a question that gives you back a, a series of of related sites and stuff. Very interesting. It's like free associating about uh, brands. Yeah, but it's not, you know, it's not, you know, it's not driven like it's not the Google algorithm of links to, you know, counting links kind of. It's a yeah, yeah. Of <laughs> well, one of the things I mean, this is another of your hobby horses, but uh, Jerry, but it is is you know abundant education. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I kind of assume that the AI will, if we, you know, if we do it right, will, you know, it's like you get to have a teacher with you all the time, kind of, 
you know, kind of commenting and critiquing and responding and answering questions. And, and I'm, I'm going to be really curious to watch how kind of the education institution reacts, whether they'll try to close it down or shut it out or, you know, because it's, you're, you're going from scarcity in education to abundance of education. And I think the institution will fight that. But and education, um, moral, moral guidelines. I want to have a Jiminy Cricket on shoulder giving me advice as to what's the right, the right answer, according to the Catholic Church, according to uh, the Imam of, Tehr of Tehran, the, according to um, MIT. Basically, you can imagine having an AI assistant um, reference base, ethical reference base, um, brought, <clears throat> brought to you by Disney. You know, brought like to you by yeah. uh, other and it, so I in scenarios like I refer to as, as a Jiminy Cricket, yeah. the Florida way. So um, yeah, actually, a, a long time ago when ISPs were young, before they were practically obliterated by the telcos and the cable companies, I had the thought that the Seven Hundred Club and Disney and a couple other entities could make bank by creating whitelist ISP services. And they would guarantee that that you could put your kids on these services, and they'd be on. Uh, they'd be okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, and I I was sort of surprised that they didn't jump into the market because they had brand name. They could have made bank. They would have, th those would have been highly profitable ventures. I think um, they might have been assaulted on First Amendment grounds or something. I don't know. I, I think that you could say it's a private club, and we've got a white list of a subset of the internet. And what, like, how could you assault that? I don't know. That's been the the uh, uh, um, augmented reality filters argument I've been making for a while. Uh, all these stuff, all the stuff that I wrote about ten years ago is finally becoming relevant. So um, what we need to do is play Ujamay on a fifteen-year delayed loop. There you go. It's like uh, having a futurist, you know, who's like always ahead of himself is just bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. The the impractical futurist. The, the Cassandra model. Yes, I, um, there's a short story in here somewhere about the sort of Willie Loman version of this. Of you know, <laughs> attention wasn't paid. Death of a death of a futurist. Futures are for closers. <laughs> oh, that actually has some really scary implications, doesn't it? <laughs> Apocalypses are for closers. Um, yeah, no, no. So I, actually, there, I had a piece in the Atlantic mm. 10, 10, 12 years ago about video, about augmented reality fil uh, future uh, filters as used for politics. So you mm. can actually go look that up. Uh, but it, the idea is that if you have augmented reality, you're going to have advertising. And if you have advertising, you're going to have people who come up with ad filters. And if you had ad filters, they have they have to be able to recognize what's what's being shown to you, and be able to block it. And mm -hmm. if you can recognize it's being shown to you to be able to block it, then you can don't have to limit that to advertising. You can block book titles. You can block faces. You can block the exist the very existence of of um, a storefront. You can re do a, a replace of a visual replacement. Anyone in drag is now is now in a three piece suit. Um, you can you know anyone with a beard is now clean shaven. You know you can do all sorts of things. Any you know any woman you look look at for more than three seconds is now naked. That kind of thing. Um, and that we'll see all sorts of that crap. As soon as you have, you know, when, when Apple comes out with its uh, mixed reality lenses this year, next year, whatever it is, when, when I, I believe that Meta has now, it, it has now patented the design for a pair of eyeglasses that do virtual reality, not just, uh, right. you know, not, not goggles. Um, so Anyway, yeah, right. And then the ability <laughs> to pay to be invisible inside somebody else's virtual virtual reality, augmented reality system. The new now here's privacy. Don't even know yeah. what you're missing. Pay for design. 
So if you want to see Lady Gaga's new outfit, it's only it's only visible in the virtual. It's only visible in augmented reality. You got to pay. You right. you you know if you want to see our building because we have a very we have a spectacular design for our building in in augmented in the augmented reality. Uh, you have you know, you have to pay to you have to get a license to see. Well, that's already uh, in happening with people with their advanced cars who haven't paid for the premium services. Yep, yep. You want to go as fast as possible in your new ele new electric Mercedes, and this is completely true. You have to want to accelerate as fast as possible, you have to pay extra, you have to pay a subscription for acceleration. In the, but we the don't newest- take, uh, But we don't own anything anymore anyway. Everything is sort of leased to us temporarily, and, and that's part of our future as well. With with premium features being held back because that's how you premium price. Downloadable content. But they're just features, they're just switches and software. It's not that the thing couldn't be all singing, all dancing. When but to me, what, what they're, they're, I keep thinking about is where do we want government to step in and say, this is, you know, this is the floor, you can't go below that floor, and this is the ceiling, you can't go above that ceiling. Um, you know, the government could say, require every car that's made now to have as standard to all buyers, all these new safety features, right? They don't only have to be for premium luxury, you know, buyers. Um, that's what we did with seatbelts, right? And it saves lives. It may cost the manufacturer a little bit more, I doubt. It's, it's interesting to me that seatbelts and smoking weren't raised more often in the mask debate. Oh, no, the seatbelts got raised all the time, at least they from, did, from, they what did, I, but from what I saw. There were other problems with the mask debate. There were. Including, yeah. Let's not go there. It's, it's, too, it's too easy to misunderstand what you just said. Yeah. About the mask debate. I mean, right. what is that? <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, on that note, well, I was just going back to this notion of the of art, the uh, you know what I've been trying to—it's artificial scarcity, right? It's like we have abundant things, and what we have to do with abundant things is create an artificial scarcity so that there can be a market. And I'm kind of wondering this—you know—I've been wondering this for a policy kind of issue: of, does government care? But if we, if we, what we're seeking in the economy is abundance. Um, the notion to create the artificial scarcity is kind of counterabundant, right? And, and, and so you, you, you're extracting from the abundance effectively, um, which I think we've been doing forever and I just had never seen it that way. I mean, it's, this is what, when Jerry's talked about the enclosure movement, what we were trying to do was create, you know, create an extractive capacity from what something that had previously been abundant. But um, yeah, I'm just wondering play, how, where, where that takes us, you know. Play Money by Julian Dibble. I'm trying to turn. Oh, there it is. Yeah. How I quit my my day job and made millions trading in virtual loot. But basically, he, he this is an entire operation. It's it's old. Um. It's uh. Yeah, two thousand six. So, um, but acceleration of the role of abundance in virtual in in games. Where you can have abundance, that and the importance of scarcity as a mechanism for for driving behavior, yeah, and the failure of games that were based entirely around abundance, that they had to inject scarcity for the game to work, and so it's just an, it it's you know two thousand six, uh, so it's very dated on some stuff, but it's a really interesting exploration of that very concept. Wanted to put a, a footnote, a footnote here, a meta comment uh, about our conversation here, uh, if you don't mind. Um, so there's a paper which I'm just dragging up, uh, recently published. It's uh, in Britain, and I can put it in here in a second. Uh, that that was sh was looking at turn taking, the time of turn taking. You all know what turn taking is. You probably all know that there's a general gen a general assumption that. Uh, you know, turn turn taking uh, is, is sort of every 200 milliseconds is is when you sort of can get in, and uh, the 
the thing that is interesting in the, the study is that people who, um, people who don't know each other very well, strangers, okay, can uh, take turns, shorter turns. People who know each other really well take longer turns. And I didn't measure it, but you know, we, this is a group that gets together and is prepared to let silence uh, proceed for a while before somebody jumps in. That's not that's not taken into in in conversational. Uh, the the study is about turn taking in conversational settings. Yeah. Huh. I'll that's put that in here because it's it's quite it's a very detailed. Um, study and i haven't i can't vouch for it all together myself, i'm but. pretty sure is it uh sandy pentland anita woolley christopher shabris nada hashmi tom malone just second not none of those i think this is uh, the next cause generation because i've got evidence collective factor in the performance of human groups 2010 which talks about yeah. equality and distribution of conversational turn taking yeah just second here yep well, it, it would be interesting to see if they quoted the, that because um, this is a very, just a second here, I'm terribly sorry. It would have to be a, a California version and a New York version. No, this is a British version. Because hmm. <laughs> if you're not uh, interrupting someone in New York, they think you're not listening to them. Good point, like you've fallen asleep or something. Right, why are you so quiet? Well, are it's you interesting. listening? So one thing I, I would love uh, in the culture, in the international communicational competence sort of realm is in what cultures is it considered polite to interrupt and do, uh-huh, yep, got it. Like in a lot of Latin places, you're always acknowledging. There's a little act for like yeah, every well, other. Yeah, that's called, that's called back channeling and that timing is has a different But, but it's meaning. culturally very sensitive. And in some cultures, you do not utter a syllable until they're done and then you turn take, then you jump in. Right. This mm. why uh, on here why I don't like psychological uh, studies because you can't they're never take in all those variables. So is that why different blocks, different geopolitical blocks form based on people's co conversational uh, comforts? I'm not sure that's the variable. I took a I took a course in undergrad at UC Irvine. I took a course in politometrics, which is sort of uh, statistics applied to politics, which was pretty interesting. And I I didn't know about statistical tools like multiple regressions. So the study I did, which is about attention spans around airplane hijackings, which were hot back then, back in the day. Um, and I went and measured. I went to the library and looked through microfilms and measured column inches on hijacking stories. Uh, and then plotted that. And they're like, you should have used a maybe multiple regression. I'm like, multiple what? Um, anyway, a piece of the, that course was about political divisions and sort of seemed, and I wish I had a stronger memory of this, seemed to posit that political divisiveness winds up at 50-50 really, really often. And the example they used was the Cold War, where you know the U.S. kind of went around the world and said, you're either with us or against us and forced people to choose sides. And the sides ended up being kind of remarkably even. And mm -hmm. if we look at the, the political splits in the world today, partly due to uh, Citizens United and unlimited money and all that, I think these, you know, if everybody pours lots of money onto both sides, so they wind up being pretty even. And I don't, I don't understand the logics of it and would like to know more about it. The fact that the sides are even in our case, Jerry, I think are, is explained by something else, but we don't have time to get into that. Uh, which is the, the the duopoly and the doom loop and you're on mute i'm talking yeah, to my wife who's showing me her new shoes and insists on my looking hold on honey would you hold up that shoe to the screen right now i think we yes. all want to see yes yes yeah. yeah. put the, put your shoe no 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 no. put foot put foot in front of in front of lens right here you know in some cultures this might be seen as insulting Ooh, look yes at those. exactly Ooh, those are nice. aren't those cool Thank wow. you. And, and what's the name of the brand? The people? Three people? No. Three people. 
Yeah. Nice. Free people. Oh my God. The free very people, cute, costly shoes. Very cute shoes. Did you so see free uh, people, costly shoes? Yes. Did you see um um oh god the riff about uh Lulu Lamond's hundred dollar anti-racist yoga pants? No, I missed this. Uh that Chris Rock. Oh my god. It, it's a very funny uh special that he just did on Netflix. And he says, I don't want hundred dollar Lulu Lamond anti-racist yoga pants. I'm I bet most people here would be happy buying $25 racist yoga pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very good. And on that note. But you said Lulu Lamond, and I'm I'm here, I'm thinking it's a person named Lulu Lamond. Lulu yeah. Lululemon. Lululemon. In, uh, I'm like, who is Lulu Lamond? Is she a movie star? Up, it's up somehow? here, Ben Lamond. Yeah, exactly. Which is a lovely place. I went to a retreat that Ben Lamond wants. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My cousins got married there. Oh, nice. Probably the same place. Maybe. Uh, here's a link to the sneakers in case anybody wants to go shopping. I just put the link for the Cyber Society in there. And, and these are all people you don't know. Oh, cool. Thank you. Uh, where'd you put the link? Because I don't see it in, in the chat. chat. Where? Well, it's, oh, I didn't hit return. Ah, that works so much better. Yeah. The Oil Society. I think you might have trimmed the URL somehow because it's not resolving as a URL. It's. You, I think you didn't copy the start of it. I no. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, there's an R in yeah. front. It must be Royal, that, Royal Society Publishing. All right. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's just an R missing at the yep, beginning. I, I got it. Philosophical transaction transactions of the Royal Society B. Yeah. Thank you. Long gaps. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I will add that to my brain notes for this call. When people so it starts out when people feel connected, they tend to respond quickly in conversation, creating short gaps between turns. So that happens. But our long gaps always a sign that things have gone awry, which is what is often assumed. There's also a lot of cultural stuff around that. I remember reading a sociology thing that that said, if you are dating a Danish woman and um, or go to meet her parents, the yes. smartest thing you can do is really not say anything, speak only when spoken to, and answer questions as briefly as possible. And you'll be showing enormous respect to them. Yes. Kind of like the rules for being in court. Yeah. Yeah. Or talking to a cop. <laughs> Well, it's surprising well, that, that, up, that I think it's a, I'm sorry. I think it's no, a fairly what? narrow definition of very narrow de definition of gap um, and right. a very narrow definition of, of um, you know, friends and strangers. Cool. Thank you for the link. That may or may not it. stand up to scrutiny. Yeah. Glad you found it. Well, Susan, another one that I would love to know if watching videos sped up helps or hurts retention or listening to podcasts sped up whether what that does to retention so have you ever seen any research on that kind of thing hmm. but, oh, okay that's a good that's question a, that's a good question like, i'm kind of it's a, my, my wife and i argue about whether you can speed stuff up I, I, well, I, what I, happens I, when you get older retention really just disappears no don't so say you that. need to control for age no maybe it may be true still is demoralizing it's more, it is demoralizing. Let me tell you, <laughs> action, it's demoralizing. Something is better left unknown. No? Yes, that's true. Um, or in my you, case, forgotten. Or forgotten. Ah, or forgotten. Damn it, yeah. there it is. Yeah. Any any last words for this month's call? We're at, we're at time, roughly. I turned I turned fifty seven on Friday. Oh, congratulations! Oh, birthday. Yay. Congratulations. I made it, made it this far. Time Look at me on. now, Ma. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. What year were you born, Jimmy? 66. Okay, 65. Uh, hmm. 49. Yay. 59. 60. Ah, boomer, 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 Gen X like me. Have you guys ever heard of uh, Generation Jones? 
yes. so so uh, so our, technically I'm a boomer, but the late boomers, there's a guy who wrote a book called Generation Jones, and he said, hey, late boomers were promised the boom. They were promised like like prosperity going upwards. Everybody gets a, a car and a house with a picket fence and a, and a cocker spaniel. But what we got was Vietnam, the oil crisis, and Watergate. <laughs> yeah, but and, that was yeah. partly our fault. Our fault? I had nothing to do with Watergate. Well, no, 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 no. The boomer's fault. Oh, well, yeah, of course. course. Well, yeah. I think I think everything is the boomer's fault. No. Yeah. Well, well that's actually that that over, those overlapping generations. Um, there's uh, I know several who describe themselves, and I'll type it in because make it easy to um, zennials. Um, so basically, ah. millennials, but very early in the, in the cycle, so that they have experience much closer to a generation X. Mm. That's good. We're getting a little fine distinctions here. I like it. And uh, all this, all the generational stuff is so controversial. It's like, oof. Okay. Congratulations, Jame. Yeah. All right. We're making it. Yes. Right. Exactly. Right. Everyone have a great. Can't morning. believe I lived this long. Oh, no. I can't believe, I, I write down the date, it's 2023, and I look at the date, and I like, I squint a little bit, and I'm like, how did I get to 2023? Wow, it just looks like a, it this looks like the future. This is what happens when you get into your 60s. It looks like the future, and I'm like, how did I live into the future? Yeah. I read it in the paper 20 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> I know, when it seems so distant. And when, when you have I wrote about it 15 years ago. Damn it! <laughs> I tell you, we need to we need to play you on on a fifteen year delay. When you have, I told you this would happen. When you have sweaters, actually, 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 when you have sweaters older than many adults you talk to, that's when you start going. Oh, dude. <laughs> that's right. It's <laughs> a thirty year old sweater. Oh my god. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a good. That's a good one. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, well, I, Great. Thank seeing you, everybody. Let's let's be careful out there. Yeah.